Uh, do you know why that is in like sparkling wine? I sure don't. Uh, I, actually I will really tell you. <laughs> Welcome back to the WPG Wine Down. I am Mark Adam. I am joined by my trusty co-star and sommelier, aka Sam, <laughs> Alex Allardyce. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, we're rolling into the the new year. Yeah, New Year's Eve tomorrow. Can we take these uh, off now? Oh yeah, yeah. let's do that. <laughs> I'll figure out all these moments. Yeah, remembers. I'm always anxious. I'm anxious to get the mask off. You're anxious to drink, although I want to drink. Too. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I'm not alone in my. No. <laughs> My desire to put wine in my face hole. Yes. Um, yeah, so New Year's Eve. We're doing it a little different. This We're going to go bubbly. Yeah, because uh, why not? New Year's Eve, we got to do it. Why not indeed? Why not? Yeah. So, so today I'll tell you about the wine we picked out. This is the first sparkling we've done. Yep. In the series so far. So this is a Cremant de Bourgogne. So if we want to get nerdy. Cremant de Bourgogne. Yeah, so that, yeah, see, For the French you, you always the got the accent, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that actually essentially means like a sparkling wine from Burgundy. And so sparkling wine can be quite confusing. I know one of my pet peeves when I started getting into wine is, which I say pet peeve, what I did before I knew what I was doing as well, but people call all sparkling wine champagne. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. You know that, right? Do you know why that is? The region, yes. Because the, the, cha the champagne is a region in France where they make this particular type of sparkling wine yeah. called champagne. champagne. And to be called champagne, it has to come from that region. Exactly, uh, yeah. So if you... Bourbon has to come from Kentucky. Right. For those in the whiskey. Scotch has to come from Scotland. Exactly. It's the same thing. So if you call like a Prosecco or something else champagne, like that's not correct. It's a sparkling wine. Also, there are some exceptions. Some bourbon cannot, doesn't have to come from Kentucky. Like 95% of all bourbon in the world comes right. from Kentucky, but there's some very, very specific guidelines that has to follow in order to be considered. So, right, but it's a whole thing, with, right? Like there's yeah. so many rules and regulations. Exactly, same with champagne. And yeah, and so like champagne is so um, like prestigious because it's from obviously the particular region, champagne itself, and it's that region lends to just really fantastic sparkling wine. So it has to do with, without getting too nerdy, it gets uh, has to do with like the soil, the climate, everything is so unique in that one area. You can't like replicate wines like that anywhere else in the world. And so it's partially to do with that. The second piece of it, it's to do with the winemaking method itself. Okay. And so that's what we call like champagne method even, <laughs> obviously named after the wine. Makes sense. Or um, you'll see like traditional method. Um, and so there's lots of, well, there's a few other regions that make wine that way cava for example if anyone mm. likes like sparkling wine from spain that's made traditional method so they're making it in the same method as champagne but again they just can't call it that right so that's what a cremant is if you've ever seen cremant on a bottle that's sparkling wine from france that's made in the same method as champagne so this is obviously cremant de bourgogne so it's sparkling wine from burgundy so it's just a little bit farther south from champagne same method, but they cannot call it champagne. Because yeah, right. But when Even you though see it's the same country, right. But when yeah. you see where, like, if you see like cava, traditional method, you see Cremant, you know you're getting that quality winemaking. They're making it in the exact same method as these like fancy like champagne houses. Well, and and to translate that for some some of the anybody who's into beer that's watching, uh, like a Kolsch. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Comes same from thing. There's a rules specific and, yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, and. If it if it's not from that specific place, technically you can't call it a Kolsch, which is right. why, uh, for instance, half pints here in Winnipeg, they call their St. James Pale Ale, St. James right. Pale Ale, but uh, you'll notice somewhere on the bottle it'll say a Kolsch style, right? Right, because it's made in that style and they're trying to honor that, but they can't call it a yeah. straight up Kolsch because it's, it's Kolsch like, not, yeah. but it's not a Kolsch, Kolsch exactly, esque, if yeah. you will. Yeah, so that's it's sort of the same thing with sparkling wine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's why I love drinking uh, Cremants because you can get the same quality as champagne, but you're not paying the price tag. Because champagne, like, the, you don't have to spend a lot on champagne, but even the cheapest are going to start around 50 bucks. So it, it is it is a bit more expensive, whereas Cremant, again, you get that quality, but it's a bit cheaper. And so obviously we've all had a tough year, 2020. So I'm many, looking for budget buys right now. <laughs> so, many, so many crazy, like things in our culture 
like in the global culture, mm -hmm. things that are world famous started in France. Yeah, that's true. I'm wearing jeans, which started in France. The, the See, fabric, I don't do jeans, so I don't know. But the fabric is called <laughs> denim, and that literally, like there's a place in France called Nîmes, and it's fr it comes oh. from Nîmes, de Nîmes, ça vient de Nîmes, if you're in French, it's, it comes from Nîmes. I don't even de know Nîmes that. became denim. And that's how we have jeans. But France is so famous for so many cultural yeah. things, but we overlook almost all of it because wine. Yeah. Because they make wine. Exactly. And we're like, oh, French wine. Well, that's why <laughs> we're here. So let's get this open. So I thought if you've seen a few of our other episodes, I did a little uh, intro on how to open uh, red wine. Mm -hmm. So I thought today, yeah. You've opened cork. A little and you cork and then, Selvin. yeah. I yeah, showed you how to do that on a uh, Selvin. <laughs> So hard. You know yeah. what's funny? There are some wines with that have Stelvin caps. Remember the wine at the club, the Pinot Grigio? Oh yeah, the God. Torricella. Yeah, sometimes the, that Italian. it's just, yeah. And every single time, all of the servers that work there, because we work together, uh, and, and yeah. all of the servers would bring me the bottle, and then I would open it. It's hard to <laughs> it open. It was a twist off. You know what? I opened one the other day, and I was like, oh, I forgot how hard this was. You wouldn't <laughs> think screw cap would be hard, but it is. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so today I will show you how to open a bottle of sparkling wine properly and i hope it goes well this always kind of backfires as soon as i say i'm going to do it but so first thing you need you need we're the, we're, we're not going to saber it i know see we thought about that it's like, but it's like new year's eve i know we should but next time but i'll show you how to do it properly and Kate, then we'll katie would be it. mad at me because it would make a mess right yeah, that's true and glass everywhere we don't need yeah, that I don't but yeah so you need your corkscrew so we have the blade <laughs> so you're going to cut the foil often on sparkling wine there's a little tab you can kind of take and peel mm -hmm. um I don't know why I don't do that. I was always taught, like, this is the proper way to do it. You cut it with the foil. So same way you would open, like, a normal bottle of wine, do the slit up, and usually you should be able to get the foil off in one piece if I've done it properly. Yeah, more or less. There we go. So then you have this is what we call the cage. So one of the most important things on sparkling wine is you always want to keep your thumb. <laughs> it's okay right now because I haven't unlocked the cage, but even my instinct rule when I take the thumb, foil off. Keep your thumb. Yeah, literal on, rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, I see some people like open a, even like Prosecco or something that has a cork. I see people walking around with a bottle just like this after you've taken off the cage. And I like, I cringe. So I'm like, literally, like you could like poke someone's eye out. You know what I mean? Like if there's enough pressure in here, if that cork were to pop and it does happen, you see videos well, of that did happen to me one yeah. time. I've been, I, I was in the service industry for a very long time. One time I was holding the wine. I got the cage off and I just got the cage off and it, I didn't even yeah. have time to get my thumb on it. Just boom. Yeah. And imagine if that had been pointed at someone's face, like how much damage would that do? Anyway, so you want to avoid accidents. I just, it, oh, I, I hate when I see that. I'm like, oh my God, that's so dangerous. But so then you kind of pop up the foil here do a few turns and it's as soon as you take this cage off because you've loosened that then. Mm -hmm. That's when immediately you take the cage off and you want to cover it. That's when it becomes important. And then you kind of tilt it to the side and just ever, see even already. And the technique by the way is not to just let the thing fly. It is, as she said, very dangerous. Right. I, so I it's not like in the movies where you let the cork explode. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you can do that, but make sure that you're pointing it at a ceiling or if you're on a back deck yeah. off into the yeah. river or and it is whatever. Fun. So if you want to like, yeah, pop the cork off, that's great. But technically speaking, like on my exam, if I'd done that, I probably would have failed. So you're and, and if you're if you're serving in a restaurant, you absolutely do not want yeah, to do that. You're not supposed to hear the pop at all. So yeah, you, well, you all just you hear twist. is a, you hear a pop. Yeah, so I can feel it coming here already. So if I've done it right. Should do it next to my mic. <laughs> you should just hear a little. Yeah. So that was even probably a bit loud, but yeah, sparkling wine. And, and contrary to what you <laughs> see in the movies, when you open it, it shouldn't just start shizzing everywhere. Because that just means it wasn't cold enough, or you did something wrong. <laughs> or yeah, or you shook it real good before you opened it. Yeah. It's it's not a NASCAR finish, like like a winner's podium. Right. You don't want to shake the crap out of right. it before you. And you'll probably notice actually that we are not drinking out of champagne glasses Why don't we, or sparkling wine glasses we never did and that was another question uh people have asked oh yeah uh, over the last uh however many episodes we've mm -hmm. done so far uh <laughs> the uh the glassware. the glassware we're choosing to use so why don't you feel that one as yeah so so these are white wine glasses obviously yeah for the past few episodes we've done a sauvignon blanc we had that white from spain so we did those in white wine glasses and the red that we did we did in a red wine glass and the difference there is the red wine glass has a bigger bowl. Like that's what we call this part here. 
And that essentially just allows more of the aromas and flavors to kind of develop in the bowl. Um, whereas white wines are more delicate. They don't have quite as many, well, for the most part, it's all kind of a generalization, but for the most part, they don't have as many aromas developing. So you can have a smaller bowl, but generally white wines will be kind of tapered upwards. So then it kind of forces the aromas up to your nose or your palate. Um, and so for today, we kind of decided to not do uh, champagne glasses, to be honest, I kind of hate pouring in champagne glasses. Always gives me it's a bit a of pain. anxiety. Yeah. It's, a, it's a small hole you got to aim for, but um, I like white wine glasses, not only for that reason, but um, I get kind of what I'm talking about. You get about. more of the flavor too. Yeah, if you're drinking like a well-made like champagne or even like a cremant like this as well, again, it's a bigger bowl. It allows more flavors to develop. Champagne glasses, everyone probably has seen, really tall and narrow. And the purpose of that is to force the bubbles up towards your nose, which is great. Like that's mm -hmm. what they're good for. But if you really want to allow, yeah, all of these amazing flavors to develop, I kind of like using a white wine glass for that reason. And when we first talked on way back on our first episode, if you go uh, like five weeks ago or whatever that was, uh, you had mentioned uh, people who suck in the air when they're tasting their wines. Right. Uh, you don't have to do that with champagne, correct? Right, yeah. Right. You don't have to bring in extra The bubbles air. kind of do that for you already. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's what's interesting, like tasting, if we talk about actual properly like tasting champagne or sparkling wine is different. Like there, yeah, there's a few things you don't do. We don't, again, we don't have to actually swirl it because again, the bubbles are kind of bringing up those aromas anyways, but. And uh, for those that are, again, i translate this back to beer people. Uh, if you're tasting a beer, same thing. You don't need to, to draw that air in because generally beer yeah. is effervescent already. All the oxygen you need is happening already. Right. Yeah. And that, yeah, so that's just like sparkling wine, but. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love this wine too. So this one, we didn't actually talk about the wine itself. Um, so this is Cremant de Bourgogne. The producer is uh, Domaine d'Edouard. They're obviously from Burgundy. And so they're using even the same grapes that you will see in Champagne. So it's 50% Chardonnay, 50% Pinot Noir. And those are very traditional Champagne grapes. Skinned Pinot Noir, because as we mentioned on one of our previous episodes as well, it's this color, it's the, the skin of the grape that gives you the color. Right. Right. See, I'm I'm there I'm saying this Learning. so that they know, but also I'm saying it so that I remember. Right, that's the best way to learn. <laughs> right, because if I say it out loud and I'm wrong, she can correct me. Yes. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be wrong forever. Yeah. And well, I would rather know. That's why we're here. Yeah. So yeah, why don't we taste this guy? I all sniffed right. it already because it's amazing. Yeah, it, it's clear first of all. Yep. Uh, aside from the bubbles, which. Yeah, which yeah, that's yeah. that's right. Uh, uh, pale Probably yellow, pa yeah, that's kind what of I that lemony saying. color you yeah, talked about lemon, before. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and and again, pale. Yeah. So for sure. And then so, the nose. Doesn't that smell delicious? It does. Yeah. It smells like candy. Yeah. It smells like um, like frosted glazed donuts or something. You know, oh, like you know what? Like uh -huh. it has that like bready kind of. Yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely like a yeah like a, a yeasty bready yes. quality to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. In, in a good way. Sometimes that can be real bad. Yeah. Uh, same with a beer. Certain beers like are yeasty and that's good, and some of them are yeasty right. and that's not good. Uh, do you know why that is in like sparkling wine? I sure don't. Uh, I, actually I will really tell you. <laughs> please do, because I actually I, this is interesting. I want to know. Right. Um, so the reason why, like, you get a lot of those kind of qualities. Yeah, they always say like brioche, like toast. You get those in traditional method sparkling wine. Like you won't get that in Prosecco, right? Prosecco doesn't smell like that. And so that's to do with the traditional method that they're making uh, the sparkling wine in. So again, without getting too nerdy, um, sparkling or like traditional method, literally the fermentation is happening inside the bottle. So you know how we talked about mm -hmm. the yeast eats the sugar in the grapes, converts it to sugar, or sorry, converts it into alcohol. That is literally happening inside the bottle. So when the yeast eat the sugar, they die, fall to the bottom of the bottle, keeps fermenting. And then the bottle, this one specifically is aged for 24 months. And that's with the dead yeast cells in the bottle. Sounds kind of gross when you think about it. There's literally dead yeast in your wine, but it's the yeast. Dead that anything in my drink doesn't sound like an appetizing way right. to describe yeah, it. So that's why this is a real <laughs> wine nerd thing. But that's literally, that's where the flavors come from. Because it's, it's the yeast that gives it that toasty, brioche like the sweeter, like donut kind of smell. That's the yeast. Oh, okay. And so when you're making Prosecco, that doesn't happen at all. You're just fermenting in a tank 
and then you just filter off the yeast. There's no yeast in contact with the wine, so you do not get those flavors. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then right at the end, um, you will get rid of the yeast and then re-bottle it. So you're not actually, the bottle you get in store doesn't have dead stuff in it, generally. But, but uh, is that a thing you can get? Yeah, well, and when we were talking about natural wine, and actually these winemakers are, are fairly natural as well, just in their farming organic and very conscious winemaking. Um, but that's what they call like pet nut, for example. That's super trendy right now, if you've heard of that. I have not. They literally make, like, there's all different kinds of ways to do it, but they're generally making traditional method sparkling. And they just, they cap it, they let the fermentation happen, and then they sell it to you. So you are get everything that's You're been going on is in the bottle. Product. Yep. Oh, yep. neat. And there's nothing wrong, like we say like dead yeast cells, like, eh, it's like well, that's... That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It sounds weird. Uh, well, I, I'm also a guy, okay, uh, in the beer world, yeast yeast is in the air when you make wine, when you make beer. Exactly. Uh, you can get yeast out of anything. Yeah. There was lit there's literally a, a company in the States, a beer, a, a brewery, where the, the brewmaster has a much bigger beard than I do, and they, they took hairs from his beard and took the yeast out of his hair from his beard and made oh my. Beer cultivated from this particular yeast and they call That's it the, cool. the beard ale. That's really and cool. It's a quite a sour because wild yeast tends to yield yeah, exactly. sour flavors. Yeah. But um See if you're not used to hearing that kind of stuff, it's like, oh my god, yeah, beer, it sounds but like, gross. But but when you're no, that's when you're, just that's fermentation. If you don't like it, don't drink fermented beverages, and when, your life sucks. So exactly. have fun with that. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's where the nerdy thing comes in, like you said. Yeah. Like uh, when you're a beer nerd, that's you're like you don't really think I want to drink that. Exactly. Whereas like if you're not really a beer nerd, you're just like like why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. anyway, so that's where that's why champagne and these traditional method wines are so unique. That's where that flavor comes from. Is purely like the method that they use to make the wine. So huh, we're okay. smelling yeast here. We're smelling dead yeast. That's good. Mm, apparently, yeah. I <laughs> Honestly, didn't know, I didn't know why that was good. It just that's now I know why. Yeah, it's kind of like this is uh, for some folks. This is a lot like uh, how do you make a hot dog? Like they love hot dogs, but then you find out how it's made, and you're, and you're like, like uh, maybe, maybe, I don't maybe know not. that I wanted to know yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. This, but but for for people who really want to know, like this is this is good info. I like yeah, this a lot. That's cool. Very neat. So now can this I can I, can yeah, I drink it? Yeah, let's drink it. I'm excited. Oh, did we did we? Go over the sniff notes? No, I didn't. No? I'm going to drink it anyway. <laughs> oh, now we can backtrack. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, absolutely. It smells like candy, though. It smells so sweet, and it's... Yeah. It, I'm, I'm, I'm getting quite a bit of sweetness on my tongue. This probably has a bit more residual sugar Compared than the to other. the other wines we drank? Yeah. I think, again, technically speaking, this would be considered dry, but this, this will have a bit more sugar. I am getting really some sweetness good. on the tip of my tongue here. Yeah, I am a bit, too, yeah. also. Yeah. It's really good. But it's, but it's um, I'm getting a lot of stone fruitiness, like yeah, like more of a like a peach. Yeah, I get like white peach almost, you know, mm. and like and there's still that like lemon lime and a little bit of apple, like yeah, like like Granny like, Smith. Yes, yeah, like yeah. a soury apple. Yeah, almost almost crab apple, but not quite. Yeah, that tart. Well, that's what I find. That just got me thinking of acidity, um, like champagne or like Cremant, like this, or really any sparkling wine always has a really bright acidity, really high, because it has to balance like the bubbles and the sweetness and everything. So you don't often notice it, because again, the bubbles kind of distract, but even that Granny Smith apple, like to me, like that lends to the acidity. But that's mm -hmm. what you want. You want it to be very refreshing and, yeah. Yeah, I'm into it. I. What would you pair with this for food? Ooh, that's a good question. I know, food, food pairing with sparkling wine is fun. Because you can do so much, like, because it's so, the effervescence takes the mild flavor and just so you you can almost do if you wanted to do a steak that wasn't overly spiced yeah. like just like a really nice maybe a little bit of salt a little bit of pepper well especially like traditional method sparkling wines like this they can kind of hold up to more, more like boldness. richer food where it's yeah. like a yeah like a prosecco or even like a cava sometimes are a little bit more just kind of basic like i don't know that they would hold up to that but this would like this has some guts to it for like, sure man uh you know what like a, a a bigger fish like a salmon or yeah that something would be like really a, good like a red fish yeah would i think that would be yeah salmon would be really nice yeah or even yeah. like like i would drink this like for breakfast i hate to say it like with brunch so even like like with quiche or something yeah. like that like that would be really good yeah something very like eggy and yeah exactly yeah or a really like classic pairing with sparkling wine is uh like well especially something like this like popcorn or even like chips or something if you're having a movie night Ooh, something salty yeah exactly yeah. just like the richness and the saltiness of like that kind of snacky food well, which is why like bubbles which is why i'm thinking like a steak that's just like salted and maybe a little bit of pepper yeah but, like you want that 
just, like you don't want to not not Montreal steak spice or anything. No. Like, you don't want to sauce this steak that I'm no. talking about. Just like a nice cut of meat, a little bit of salt, get that yeah. salty savoriness, and then with their cremant, why not? I'm, I'm in. I'm, I'm into it. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, fun little fun little New Year's wine. And there's all kinds of like wines you can drink like for New Year's, or even like talking about sparkling wine. Like we, I mentioned a, a few times, like Prosecco, Cava, um, Cremant. But there's lots if you're looking for like really good quality and like budget friendly sparkling wine. You can do um, there's a Cap Classique wines from South Africa. Those are made again this uh, traditional method, and they can be extremely affordable actually, and they're delicious. Oh, wow. Those are often a good find. Spain is so cheap to quality. I feel. Why is that? They are. Um, Just not well known yet. Maybe like, I don't know because even yeah, talking about Cava, Cava's made the same method as champagne but it is a fraction of the cost that's probably the cheapest i think you can get but it's so that. good like yeah. it's not it's not like it's worse wine than what you're getting out of champagne or 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 the burgundy region or whatever yeah it's it's just way cheaper yeah. one thing i i can think of and like i could probably think on that and give you a better answer but the first thing that comes to my mind right away is that uh in champagne obviously it's kind of more northern france and the weather is very like all over the place you know you can get hail in the spring you can get frost like there's so many different things that play there and that's why often you have um, champagne that's blended over different vintages because you can't ever trust your crop in one year you like you save like the like all of these wines that are like fermenting in bottle and everything you you keep them and you blend them together after because you yeah you can't trust mother nature because you don't know what's going to happen and that increases the price of the wines you know you have a really terrible vintage that's going to make it more expensive. Whereas you go to Spain, where Cava's from, around Barcelona, it's gorgeous every single day there. It's fine. <laughs> like the, they don't gotta like worry about any of that. It just it's almost like easier wine making, you know, a bit. So, so it, it, they it, don't have to charge more for it. Oh, uh, you know what? That makes. And I've never thought about that. I just and I because for the last bunch of years, I'm like Spain isn't really well known, but all these wines that are Spanish, I tend to like as much or better than. French or Italian yeah, wines. I love Spanish wine. But, I but then I, love but it. then I turn around. I'm like, why is this bottle ten dollars cheap? Do yeah. I just have a cheap palate? But I, it's not. It's, no, no, it's, not necessarily. It's, and it's like I was saying. There's just like there's the prestige of like champagne as mm -hmm. well, um, and a lot of it's to do with even like labor and stuff. Without like, I'm not going to even touch that because that's out of my <laughs> area of expertise. But like, that's that's part of it, right? There's a lot of like cheap labor in Spain. Like even when. I was working in the south of France, like just over the border from Spain. There was a lot of like young um, kids from Spain who were like my, I say kids, they were my age. And they were just like looking to like work in the summer and they're just like, they're almost like working for free on these vineyards because it's fun. And really that's what I was doing there too. But that's what you see a lot of in those like uh, wineries and stuff in Spain, especially around Barcelona. Uh, whereas you go to France and people working in champagne houses, no, 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 you're paying those people a lot to do what they do there and and that's just it's just it's the market right yeah like, and I there, I'm, if there's a lot more uh like in champagne you were saying like the vintages they have to like blend together like yeah that takes a lot more expertise like you're saying oh yeah so, exactly you can't yeah. just have some random kid be no. in there just stirring a pot like it's no, not like you're not trusting any or someone like me was like i want to come to france and make wine sure no, I couldn't do that in Champagne. No Champagne house is going to take me and be like, sure, come on and help us. No, no, no. I, I would not be allowed in the building. <laughs> That's fair. And so, okay, that, that explains the difference in price. Yeah. But, I, but I do find that the quality of those wines is yeah. quite good, yeah. especially if you're talking bang for buck. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So another New Year's tip, uh, maybe try adding to your New Year's resolution, spending less money on wine without losing any quality. Yeah, and just kind of exploring like different... Uh, yeah, different countries that you wouldn't have tried before, and yeah. The trick there is say your New Year's resolution is to spend less money on wine. That doesn't mean you have to drink less wine. No, exactly. Just a, that is not what we want to do in 2020. Pro tip. <laughs> yeah, I. There is no way after 2020, I'm vowing to drink less booze. No, exactly. I'm no. gonna drink more wine like this. This is this is delicious. <laughs> this is delicious. Yeah. Well, well hey, listen. Happy New Year. Yeah. Because we're not gonna see you until 2021. Yes. So happy new year. Yeah. COVID, cheers, COVID, COVID cheers. cheers. Thanks guys, thanks for joining us.